the beauty is it's the same process. The question is at what time do you pay and how much? So the process is the same. Somebody will call up a mortgage broker and say, either say, I have no clue where I'm supposed to go. I have this deal. What can you get? Or they may say, I have a clue. I have an offer. Can you beat the offer? Hey there. I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why? Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast. Today, I'm here with Ira Zlotowicz. Ira is a commercial uh, real estate revolutionary. He's devoted his life and career to creating opportunities for people and launching GParency is no different. Um, Ira, I want to first just say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come and talk to me today. I'm excited to share with our listeners your story and um, talk about what you're doing in the business world. And and, um, just thank you for that, taking that time. I appreciate it very much. Let's uh let's just start with with your background. Let's uh tell us your story, kind of what where you came from, what you're doing now, what what why you um created GParency and kind of go from there. I guess so I'll start the uh, my work career. So the I spent the bulk of my uh work career almost entirely. My whole work career is doing commercial mortgages. So I used to tell people that I'm actually not that I'm a mortgage broker, I'm a trusted advisor. So as the industries change and different needs, so the root will always be the same. Let me be a trusted advisor, try to help people. Um, I wore the hat really as a mortgage broker my whole career. Um, and for the old loan majority of my time, I spent over 20 years, I founded a company called Eastern Union. It's a premier commercial mortgage broker. Um, we rose, God's help, to um, number 10 in dollar amount, number three in the number of transactions a year, $5 billion a year in brokering. And I always felt that there was something that was really wrong that the market was evolving. Um, when I came into this business, someone once told me that just remember, what you really are as a mortgage broker is you're really a data provider. You sell data. You sell banking data. You sell underwriting data. You know how to underwrite a deal. You know who's hot, which bank is hot today, which loan officer is hot, what the, what the products are. Unlike a co-star, which charges a monthly subscription, you charge this big fee when you close. So just remember you're a data provider. And it was stuck by me. And I realized that as the internet you know, open the way it did. Everyone really, every one of us really works on LinkedIn. You know, we work for LinkedIn. And you go on LinkedIn, you get whatever you need. And the more people know about the banks, they might need different levels of resources and help. And the mortgage business was always about um, take it or leave it. Use a broker and pay this big fee when it closed. Don't use a broker and run the risk of having to navigate the waters yourself if there was an issue. The other issue I have that bothered me is the pricing. Why was the pricing based on caps? So no matter how you know, big the deal is you pay more. It should be based on time and value. If I'm a professional, you hire an attorney. How do you pay an attorney? The better attorney earns more per hour. But they get paid a blend of time and value. So um, a little over two years ago, I got offer for venture capital to revolutionize the commercial real estate finance space. And we opened up GParency. GParency is America's only commercial mortgage broker with cap fees. So we rolled out many products. So different needs, for different bars at different times. So all of them come along with a either fixed fee or a fee that has a cap. So it doesn't just go to this, this crazy number. And, you know, you know I'm, I'm really ecstatic. I feel like I'm living the dream. I'm getting to bring on new brokers and train them and let them make a living in this business. And I don't have any non-competes. They can come and learn a business and go off wherever they want to go. If they want to stay in the real estate field but not stay here. And on the other side of the coin, I am able to help borrowers. And I can show it to a borrower, hey, I'll guarantee the best rate, best terms, and you'll never overpay. And you'll never, I can tell people, do you have FOMO? You go to sleep at night, like think, oh my gosh, someone got a better rate. I said, I cure it. I cure FOMO. Because I have all different products to get you comfortable. So I feel like I'm providing a value to a client, value to the, to the brokers by me. And, you know, creating for the banks also a happier. They get deals sent to them, the right deals, without having to, you know, go through a ton of deals that don't make sense to them. I know which banks want what. I put those all together. So across the board, that everyone is happy across the board. And I couldn't be happier, you know. I'll end with this, you know, this line and this long-winded answer is that, you know, this inspired quote from Jeff Bezos, it's irresponsible to be a homeowner, to be a homeowner in America without being an Amazon Prime member. 
I want to build your parents to the point that it's irresponsible to finance a commercial real estate deal without running it by your parents. And that's my goal. Sometimes I'll make five hundred dollars, four ninety five, just giving you a list. And sometimes I'll make, you know, uh, you know, the hundred thousand dollar fee cap to closing. And depending on what you need, everything is different. No, that's great. So, I mean, obviously your your background in the space allowed you to, you know, find what problems you saw, what wasn't, what wasn't working, what, what, how, so maybe for people listening, it would be good to walk through traditionally the process, what happens when you go to a broker and how that all works. And then kind of what's different, um, when people come to you at GParency and, and, and l let people hear like kind of what that, the contrast is. So the beauty is it's the same process. The question is at what time do you pay and how much? So the process is the same. Somebody will call up a mortgage broker and say, either say, I have no clue where I'm supposed to go. I have this deal. What can you get? Or they may say, I have a clue. I have an offer. Can you beat the offer? And typically, it's one of those two of the most common. But the third one is that I already have another broker I'm using. Why should I switch to you? But it's the same starting point. It's the same. Mm -hmm. And then our banking team, we have a centralized banking team. One of the uniquenesses that I built is that all the deals are underwritten. And the bank relationships are maintained by the core in the house. So they get the real hands-on knowledge of knowing everything that's going on. As opposed to each broker running their own book. They run their own book in the relationship, placing the deal, and they can partner up with the banking team. But this way, there's one central home that has all the banking knowledge. And we have amazing technology, proprietary technology, that does the matching. But the process for a borrower is a borrower comes in, shows the deal to the banking team, to the broker. The broker discuss with the banking team and the internal team. They review the deal. And they come back to the borrower with a soft quote, soft opinion. And they say, for this deal, I think you'll get a rate of you know, 6%, 7%, 5%, 10%, whatever, the, whatever this product type and market um, 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 demands. And probably proceeds of about you know, 9.2. And then they discuss what kind of terms do you need? Do you want longer term? Do you think rates are going up? Rates are going down? And they start to strategize and like get a feeling for what the client is more important to the client. So now they have the framework, they know it's more important to the client, they'll take that combined information and start submitting it to lenders to match the different needs of the borrower. Unlike a home, it's very simple. It's interest rate, you know, it's your credit and your income. Over here, there's so many other pieces to the puzzle. So therefore, you take all this information in, you'll send it out to the list of banks that you put together a curated list of banks, send it out to those banks, you come back with a with a different term sheets. You narrow them down to the best few. You go back and forth to the bar on the bank. They agree to terms, and then the regular banking move forward. The broker runs the process from the beginning until the end. It's like I I call a really good broker is a pot of that equity. Like right. I tell a broker, you know, your dream is, your goal is, when you're on the phone with a bank and the bank tells you, sorry, Ira, I can't give you the nine million two in the last example, but I'll lower the rate by a quarter point. And we'll give them more interest only. I should be able to say, done, send the term share, as opposed to, let me speak to my borrower and get back to you. I should really know the client's thinking about why they need what they need and then move forward. So right. in, that, in that scenario, the broker and the old and the conventional scenario, no, no money transferred between the borrower and the broker. Any money that there had to be money coming up was between the borrower and the lender. If and when the transaction closes, on that $9 million to deal, I'll submit an invoice for $92,000. So transaction closes, closing party, everyone's happy, and we go home. That's what would happen. The difference on the Japanese front is that, first of all, all the tools that we use, we make accessible to the borrower. They could see the bank list. They could use the underwriting calculators. They could see all the sophisticated tools that we use and make it accessible to our borrowers. So right off the bat, the borrowers much more in the know. We don't keep this like mystique behind the scenes. The reason why many conventional brokers make those big fees demand them is this mistake. I don't know what the hell I just did, but I gave it to IRA and closed. You know, I once you break out the mistake, it becomes easier. And really, the difference is I walk over to a client up front and I say, "Listen, let's have a more intelligent conversation." Mortgages, when you're dealing with a quality shop, is basically like a commodity. Of course, if you don't know the business, it's not a commodity. But when you're dealing with the top three brokers you deal with, there's roughly no difference between them. So I said, the question is, why do you use a broker? I make the client think long and hard. Why do I use a broker? Why don't I go direct? And depending on what their answer is, I have a product that I answer. So I say, don't overpay, depending on the answer. So 
the most common answer that people give is you know the name and you know which banks are hot. I said, that's all you need, $495. So I'll give you the list of the banks. No, but they don't know me. But who's going to, oh, you want my knowledge? You want my ability, my relationships? You want to tap into my relationships? Okay, $4,500. I'll take the deal. I'll leverage my relationships. I'll go to that list of banks that I gave to you. I'll create the competition and I'll get your best term sheet. Oh, but how we can get the deal to the closing table? Okay, you want someone on my staff to do it? And instead of the 4500 pay me 11000 for the whole package. I'll do everything from start to finish. But how do you know the deal's going to close? I take that money up front. Oh, you're nervous about a deal closing? That's not what you started with. But if you're nervous about a deal closing, no problem. I'd rather this. I, I'm happy you're nervous. Pay me nothing. But when this deal closes, I'll tell you my new pricing for the world. Instead of 1%, I'll charge a half percent. I'll do the minimum at some level, but let's talk on the high end of it. Capped at 100 grand. I'd love that. If you're nervous about closing, I don't know why you'd be nervous, but if you are, all day long. I'd rather get a half point at $100,000 fee, capped at 100000 So now the client steps back and starts thinking. Like, if you're really willing to get more at closing, and you, you're going to take up front, and you don't care, what do I really need? And I force the client to actually think why they use a broker. And that's really the change what's happening over here. Like my ad campaign we're running up now is that banks have changed since 1927. Commercial mortgage fees have not until you parents it. And that's really like, that's the mo- like, get you to think what? And if you look at everything else we do, everything is a la carte. Every subscription you subscribe to is an unlimited option. It's a a la carte option. It's a hybrid option. Mortgage is all in one. And even, you know, people ask me like, you know, how do you work so cheap? You know, that's the biggest question. How do you do a deal for 11000 I said, you're only asking me that question now because you think it's normal that you once paid 200000 or you once paid 100000 Look right. at your attorney. How much you pay an attorney on a typical closing, commercial closing? Five to 15000 That guy went to law school, has a degree. Has sweats to you know his all everything you have to do to get here debt. Yeah. What did a typical mortgage broker do? Great talker, has some relationships, and they're worth the, they have to get hundred. So I tell people today, my prediction is that people are telling me today I'm a cheap broker. It sounds too cheap. In another couple of years, it becomes more and more mainstream. They're going to flip the narrative and they're going to say, Ira, you charge me eleven thousand dollars to push paper to make a few phone calls. That's crazy. I think I'm an expensive paper pusher. If you look yeah. at it, depends where you're starting, man. Don't have this thing, know you're worth a bottle of water, right? Depends on where you buy that bottle of water, how much it costs. Right. Same type right. of uh, concept there. Yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it's a really, and, and, you know, we spoke, you asked me that same question and it is, it does make you think, it makes you, and I think that that attorney um, kind of comparison is a good one too, because it's it's true. I mean, you, you're paying the attorney based on, you know, sort of the, the, the time spent realistically and, and, um, and, and to some degree, they're going to charge plus or minus based on how, how much they think their time is worth. But at the end of the day, you have, it, it's, it's very quantifiable as to what the, what the attorney's value brings to the table, even your property management, right? It's a percentage of revenue brought in. So it's, it is, um, something I, I hadn't thought about before. So being able to, know you know kind of that you can come in at different points in the because i think it it certainly from my perspective at least having the the leverage uh the relationships to leverage you know so so i don't know that i would want just a list but then maybe that next level um or or even um you know going going the farther i mean regardless i think it's nice that you have options the most popular product over over almost 60 percent choose to 4,500, because they realize that's really what I need. I need to, once I get you the term sheet signed, do you need help paper pushing? Like I tell an owner, you're smart enough to find the deal. You're fine enough to raise equity, manage the asset. I bring you the right lender, I negotiate the term sheet, you sign it. You can't take it from there to closing. And if there's a problem, like do you think that you can't solve it over me? If there's really a problem, no one can help you. And if there's no problem, talk to them, they'll listen to you. Like, what are you thinking? And that's really what's starting to uh, take off. In the beginning, they start with the 11,000. They start with the half a point of closing instead of a point. And then they say, no, so I'm going to do the whole thing. I want to pay up front. And slowly but surely, they get comfortable and say, what the heck? It was a waste of money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And but, you know, the, the best also analogy, like in today's you know, timing of this, of, of this recording, is what's really going on in the NAR, the National Association of Realtor Settlements, Settlement. Like one of the things I just offered, I just opened up now um, to to give back, it's like, 
I'm offering a proprietary training in commercial real estate to any, any real estate agent that wants to just see what it's like to get a feeling of commercials for them. Not necessarily financing, just commercial real estate. I opened it up for them. So what, what's interesting is that what, you, if you watch all the articles, is it good for brokers, bad for brokers? I think they're missing the whole point of why it's terrible for brokers. Terrible. Now, are going to be some survive and thrive, of course, because they'll reinvent themselves, but here's why it's terrible. Until now, if you're selling your home, and I come to you and say, Jason, you're selling your home, I own this mystique. If you pay me my 6%, bottom line is I have bar, buyers, sell. doesn't make a difference to you. I'll close at the best price. It's a mystique. Trust Ira, he closes, it's done. And now what is forced to happen is no more mistake. I can't tell I'm bringing buyers. I'm not bringing anybody. I'm representing you. Buyers are, buyers are having buyer agents. So the person making a pitch to you says, okay, Jason, I'll sell your house. What exactly are you doing, Ira, for me? Break it down. Oh, I'm posting on the MLS? I just do it myself. You're going to fend phone calls from me? You're going to oh, schedule an open house? How much is that worth? And that's going to cause a conversation where you know, someone else could come and sell differently. Now, on the flip side, Jason, you want to buy a house? Sign this document to me. And what happens? Oh, you'll pay me on a four hundred thousand dollars house twelve grand for what? I'm not paying a twelve freaking grand for what? I'll call, go on to MLS myself. I'll find the house. I'll look mm -hmm. at it two o'clock in the morning. So it's gonna. That's the problem that everyone's not really realizing. They never realized they owned the mystique. It was this mystique that was presented. Give me your listing. I'll make it happen. And the buyers brokers didn't have to do much work even sometimes. They, they work. I mean, they don't have to convince someone to pay them. There was an open there. You find me a buyer. So buyer said, I'm not paying for it anyway. I might as well get, give Ira the listing, whether he's good or bad. He's going to hustle for me, and that's it. So it's like, that's what's changing, the mystique. And when they break that down in every industry, you're forced to articulate exactly what you bring into the table. I think the game starts changing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it is interesting timing based on that whole ruling. But and it, it, it's funny because I've always sort of thought it didn't okay, having a buyer's broker didn't always make sense to me. It was like, well, can't I just do that? But it, I mean, it's, you know, it's like getting someone who, like you said, if you want, if you're nervous, you want someone to get you through the closing table and kind of hold your hand. To me, that's a lot of what you're paying for in that instance. It's just that, no, that about hand what, I, holder. I, I, I think there's a very big need for a buyer's broker because a buyer's broker is actually going to, like come to you and say, hey, Jason, the last three houses I found buyers for, I got it from the below list. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's the, the mindset. So I think what's important is that the issue is that even though it's important, are you going to pay someone $12,000 for that? Are you going to say, okay, what are you doing for me? You're a good negotiator? Fine. I'll pay you 1%. Like, the fees are going to change by the fact that you have to put it onto the table and articulate exactly what you're doing and ask the person to pay. When you have to ask for payment, it's very, very tough. When selling a home, the reason why it's not an issue is because everyone knows you're paying a broker. It's really the question you're paying me, him, or her. Right. That's all. But now there's a new, you know, all these tech companies, I think, that went technology-based, that went out to these large, you know, that said, hey, we'll list for you and we'll coordinate the showings. And those, those companies are going to take off like crazy. That's right. Yeah. Because, you know, some good negotiators and say, hey, pay me a point. We'll engage that technology for another $1,000. And that's the best deal for you. Something along those lines. And that now go back to my business. Mr. Klein, it's not like use a broker, don't use a broker. Oh, I'm a broker. How do you want to engage me? And, and, and when do you want to pay? Do you want to engage me up front? You want to pay me this product? It's much cheaper to pay up front. You want this product? But I'm the same broker. Start to finish. Where do you want me to start? Where do you want me to finish? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's truthfully probably where a lot of things will go, you know, over time. With some of that, I think you're right that the mystique is... A lot of the mystique in a lot of those industries are is is getting broken down by technology. Uh, mm -hmm. This, I guess, this ruling makes it a <laughs> a sure thing in the sense that you know you, they're they're I don't even know all the ins and outs, but basically deciding, you know, this this is not going to be a standard anymore. So I, I think that that type of um, treatment of certain processes, transactions, things like that is going to change it probably across it's going to there's going to be some fallout here um, across industries, I would imagine. And, and uh, you're, I guess, ahead of the curve because essentially you've already started that process on the commercial mortgage broking brokering side. What is can can if someone comes to you, can they can you access them sort of any loan product? Like, Bridge, uh, CMBS, can we go agency? Like, how, how is that 
going to be is is that going to be exactly the same where you know kind of you can help someone get to to any point or what's your um do you have a a niche product type or how 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 would you approach that so so prior to actually prior to opening up Japancy, which would be a little sound counterintuitive is i had a box i didn't do everything you know i had certain car bags. and the reason for that was because i only got paid when i closed so someone came over to me and said, hey, can you do a car wash? Of course I could do a car wash. But if I don't understand car wash businesses fully, if I wasn't going to take on a deal with you, knowing that I'm only getting paid when I close, which basically meant only paid if I offer you the best offer. But when you tell me I have an offer for 8% and I thought that was high, I go down the line, I realized I can't get better than 8%. Today, I have the greatest technology. I track 43,000 lenders in America. I actively run the top 3,000. And I track the quotes and the bids and everything that we could get our hands on from them. So now it's really my narrative to you is, that, listen, you have a car wash. Here's the question. Do you believe there's a lender out there that can do the car wash? Of course, the answer is yes. So I wouldn't take that on on a half point based on closing because I'm not in the car wash. Business. But if you want the same banking team that knows real estate, knows it under, right? Knows how to talk to the lenders, creates competition, we have a list of the banks, you can see all the banks that lent on car washes and call them up and track down the right person to pay for that product. So today I flipped it to the client. Again, what is it you need? If you think all I'm doing is labor, time, and value, then I can do any property in America. I could always do any property in America. Like I always said it, if I got a call from my uncle and said, hey, I would do me a favor. I'm stuck. I have this deal. It's yours. Just get a close for me. I could get a close. The issue is, if I'm competing, I can't know in advance all the nuances to run into an issue later. So like, you know, take synagogues and churches. It's the toughest things to place. Because to the lender, you want to foreclose on your local church, your local synagogue? Hell no. You know, I once had a bank tell me, he said, right, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll do a place of worship for you, but here's the deal. If they, if they, if they, um, if they, um, um, if they foreclose, if they stop making payments, I'm, we're going to create an entity called Zlatowitz, my last name and my former company, and we're going to put the notes into that entity and then have that entity for, for a foreclosure. And so Zlatowitz is foreclosing on a house of worship. So you're not, you want me to do it alone? Like, that was the question. So. I tell them back, like, so I could do every loan, but now I could actually provide. Like, it's like an interesting thing along the same treatment memory here is that typically a person has a small deal. I said, I have a minimum fee. It doesn't make sense to use me when I was at a broker, a conventional broker. I'm only getting paid at closing. I have to be worth the time, I'm taking a lot of risk. So someone calls me up for a small deal at your parents. Like, I don't know, like a few hundred thousand dollars. And I said, like, maybe it was 550 or something like that. And I said, I don't think it pays the 4,500. You should go yourself. Like, take the list of banks. Like, it's not like, you know, what are you doing? He says, let me tell you why I'm using it. He says, I have a build. I have a business. This is a side building that I have. I happen to have this business. But I know that there's going to be a huge difference in professional shopping without a professional. At the end of the day, no one's working on my deal. Even if I pay them 10000 there's no appeal at closing. Wow, we closed a $500,000 deal. No one cares to say that. But it doesn't hit the newspapers. But you're telling me they have a product for $4,500 to the same banking team. They don't, make it, they don't care what size deal is. It's the same banking team. Is going to call up for this deal versus the same thing working on twenty million dollar deals. I know that I'll recoup my forty five hundred dollars within that when they go. So it even takes it's like that opened up my eyes to a whole new perspective from a client side. Forty five hundred dollars on a on a deal even a few hundred thousand dollars not a lot of money. They want a professional to hold their mm -hmm. hand. And I looked at it like I'm always thinking a point and like you're going to pay up front the same price. And that's an interesting uh, takeaway. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I would agree. I, I would. I guess there's a, a an extent to which you, after having this conversation, that you think it's worth you know paying for those things. But I, I would want at least that you know sort of professional uh, you know to be to be the face of the financing part of that whatever deal it is. Even um, I mean, yeah, the, the smaller deals that I, I actually think that's a great point because the smaller deals you might feel like it's not worth it, but probably at the end of the day to have, I think people downplay people outside of the space and maybe new to to um commercial real estate downplay the significance of the lender and the and the the debt product that gets placed in any deal uh, you know for me it it's probably the most important thing at this point like it's just incredibly impactful as to the performance of your of your asset you know whether it's a a business or a, or a, a multifamily property or a, or a, a place of worship, any of that. I mean, I think that the debt product on it is going to make 
such a huge impact on what you are actually able to accomplish in your expected pro forma and business plan that um, for me, having someone, you know, <laughs> being a part of that transaction is, is very appealing. Having someone that's, you know, at a sort of a capped or fixed rate is, is also very appealing. So I think it, it's a very, very smart um, product to offer to people. And I think, I think you're, you're right that that's probably the direction that a lot of um, you know, sort of real estate is going to be headed in, in different, different avenues. Yep. We feel the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, well, that's, I, I mean, it is, it is fascinating. What's, uh, do you see, what do you see as, as you know, kind of the evolution, whether it's with G or, or, um, loan products in general, do you think that this is, you think there'll be a lot of other companies following in your footsteps? What, what do you see so, happening over time? So I'll tell you what's interesting, but what I think, um, you know, just like on the residential side, what happened on, on with Fannie and Freddie on the commercial side, the multifamily side, I pulled commercial, large buildings, five more units pulled commercial as far as yep. the multifamily. They came out pretty strong saying that we don't want you using brokers. You can, but you're going to be penalized. Slower process, more due diligence, maybe pricing might be a little wider, you won't get as many exceptions, things like that. So what I think is going to happen is I don't think that my competition is going to come from a conventional competitor. I think that they, what makes a great broker is their confidence. They're delivering better than anybody else. And you want me and only I'm going to deliver. And that's what it takes. Yeah. So I see you smiling. I guess you, uh, you share that sentiment that how they, you know, they talk. They, so, they all do again, say that. Yes. That's, and, and again, that's that why true. I bring down the, you know, interesting. Like I met someone, a client says, I'm using this broker. He's much better. I said, if you want to know the best investment? I'd some have a big deal, like 60 or 80. I don't remember the exact number. That I, I said, he's using another broker. I said, how many banks do the other broker go? Six, whatever the number. I said, $4,500. Give me the $4,500. I'll shop it to the rest of the market. I said, if I create competition for one basis point, you 10x your return. Like, right. It's like a whole new perspective to look at it. Yeah. Not only did we get the better rate, we got the better bank. Ended up taking my term sheet back to that broker. already signed with them. The broker gave him a discount. He saved on the rate. Broke, and he says, wow, this mistake is gone. So the the banking industry wants what I think is going to happen. I think my competition is going to become now is not really those conventional brokers. It might be someone who left a brokerage shop, was an underwriter, got laid off, and does deals for clients on the side. Okay, but that's not a firm. I think what's going to happen is I think many attorneys are going to start offering broker service. So as an attorney could call me up and they could say, all right, who's the banks I could go to? Plus, they deal with banks all the time, right? They're dealing with other right. clients. And now if their, deal, their fee is 15 grand, billable hours, on a deal, they might be able to get now 20 or 25 to be the quote to be the broker. I'd rather have an attorney, a great negotiator attorney, help me out if I can. So, oh, but it might be missing the underwriting. So they might hire me just my underwriting. But they might partner up with a due diligence firm. I'd also offer brokerage, due diligence firm and attorney offer. So I think a lot of other ancillary, like a title company, might throw it in. That's what I think my competition is going to become. So that's fine for me also because, like I said, I'm creating a product where they'll license my banking list. They'll pay the 495 so they'll use that product. Or if I have to come with another product, somewhere between 495 and the 4500 So my, I think other people are going to come out with ways to compete to the bar, be client-facing. And it just might be downward pressure on some of my products. But again, like I said, there's 100,000 you know, deals financed a year, I think, commercial deals, some number like that. You know, my business plan, if I get 10%, 20%, 30%, like, there's, there's, even if I got 80%, there's still 20% left. Like There's a whole uh, universe that's left. So I, I, you know, it's really the question is, that some people ask me is like, what's going to happen to the brokerage space? I think the brokerage space is, is evaporating anyway, the typical half a point point space, because as people know everything, and a company like Japan is forcing you to actually think why use a broker, mm -hmm. and the fees aren't there. It, 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 I used to hire, you know, I used to, you know, when I, I'm, I'm hiring, I hired 100 brokers in the last night. So I'm building out an affiliate program. People could be in the real estate space and refer me clients to the referral. That's what I'm building out. So I hired 100 brokers. I have about 100 brokers apply for a job. I offer just a couple of them, literally one, two, or three a day a job. And these are, these are remote throughout the country. And I'm realizing by, by when I hired this group, the first one I used to hire my whole career, my pitch when I hired someone is, hey, Jason, you want to come work here? It makes no sense logically someone you need a broker. The guy owns a bunch of real estate, knows his banks, he needs to pay a broker. 
but it's a numbers game. Some people don't want a broker. Some people think you get them a better rate. Sometimes you do have a better rate. Sometimes they know a bank you don't know. It used to be that brokers got better. Now they don't get better. It's a lot of ticket. But when you close, you can make big fees. You can make seven figures. I train people. I, you know, I, the, the team I trained over my career, we tallied up, probably closed over a trillion dollars worth of deals. So these guys went in from poor, poor walking in the door to being worth and making millions a year. I tell, but again, one out of 10, one out of 20, one out of 30. One out of a hundred. Now I tell a person, you're never going to make the millions. So it's pretty much a short bet to make a living. You should be able to make a high probability to make a living if you're doing steps and God shines his graces on you. Because the $4,500 is quick, even if he's competing, even if he's going direct. Now it's the universe was only people who use the broker that weren't 100% happy with their broker. How big is that universe available? So it's going to shrink and shrink. And that's why I think. So I think the industry is going to keep changing and evolving. Like, think about travel agents. Can you book your last flight? You went online or you booked all the travel agents. So travel agents exist typically for business travels at one service. It's typically for last minute flights where they know how to broker mile deals. So you go online, hey, the tickets for unit of business class ticket to fly cross country is seven thousand dollars. It's last minute. And they can but use a mile program and get it for uh, you know, buy the points and thirty five hundred, they split the difference, you both win. But you don't have the normal travel agents that exist anymore. And that's why things that happen to the commercial mortgage broker space. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. I, I think it's... There will always be, always be a human. I don't tell people. My debate is you'll always have a human in the middle. The yeah. question is, what are you calling the human? What are you paying the human? How are you paying the human? When are you paying the human? That's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I, I love just the idea of, of, you know, kind of having that optionality where it's like certain people are going to need different products within within your company and, and having... Is it the list? Is it the, you know, hand holding all the way to the end? I think either way, it, it's a, it's a great piece to have. So um, yeah, fa fantastic. Um, Ira, let me, let me switch gears. I want to get to ask you the questions I asked every guest. The first one is, is based on the name of the show being know your why. So um, what is your why? What, you know, what, what, what got you to, to, to build this? Um, obviously you're, you're seeing the brokerage business differently than most others. What, What's kind of pushing you forward at this point? The why is to be able to help people. And um, the pro and the con of being a visionary is exactly that. Sometimes you said I'd be ahead of the curve, and sometimes I had my mistake was there is no curve. It's, it falls off a cliff. And sometimes, yeah, I was ahead of the curve. There was a road there. People didn't see it. Then I was able to be on that right road first. Um, be able to help people. And, and part of helping people is tell them, hey, as the world changes, they should know it's changing. Like, whoever's not going to adapt, I was the first one very strong in AI. I said, AI is going to change the world. People will be in trouble from it. And adapt. And be like, nah, you know, you're talking about everything, you know, and look what's going on. I mean, it's right. just getting started, right? And I'm sure that, you know, we're doing a podcast. From the time you finish this podcast until it's uploaded, the amount of time you had to spend when you did your first podcast till today is probably drastically less. And, and the quality is much higher. So mm -hmm. imagine if you had, had a person that used to help you, you don't need that person anymore. You're doing it yourself. So everything is changing so quickly. And I think that the why is how can I help people make sure they don't get messed up on all different sides of the, of, of, of the aisle. You know, with that, someone asked me once, I said, Ira, when you're changing the price, you're going to cause damage to a lot of mortgage brokers. So they said, listen, go ask your spiritual leader. What do your spiritual leader say? Can you do that? And I said, interesting question. And so, well, first of all, no real broker, like I said before, felt them harming them because they said, Ira, don't worry, no one's going paying 11000 up front if they want a broker at closing, pay big fees, you know, that mindset. Yeah. But I said, listen, let me ask, you know. So I asked, and the question they asked me is, are there more owners or brokers? Are there more owners that are going to benefit of brokers? So why, is you, why should you be protecting brokers versus owners? Maybe protect owners, help the owners. Right. And that, so that was like the direction I went. And so the why, I feel like I get to help everybody. I get to help someone who wants, someone wants to get into commercial real estate space. Join my company. I'll work with you. If you're successful, great. If not, you learn real estate. So mm -hmm. I get the help on all sides. So to me, I'm like, I feel like I'm living the dream. You know, people want to make money and then give back. If you can do it at the same time, help people make money at the same time, it's even better. So I'm fortunate and I hope that uh, you know, this takes off exactly the way I want it to go to, to be able to continue living out this why. Keep helping people. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, tell us something about yourself that it isn't common knowledge. Special skill, a hobby, just something no. to let people know you better. Was he saying that I'm, I'm an Orthodox Jew? He's saying that's common knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> it, might, it might be. I, I'm, I'm yeah. sure amongst uh, your your close yeah, friends same, and family, uh, it is. <laughs> right, like somebody told me, you know, he, he gets he has a yarmulke in his car because when he gets 
on the side. If he gets pulled over the side, and the, see, the car breaks down, he puts it on, he gets something to you know, help him out. Right. So um, I think that, you know, the what people don't know is that when, when I wanted to go into business, I, uh, the business I wanted to open, was well, also like a revolution to an industry. I wanted to open up a business called Kleesham. There's only three items that we use. Today it's only down to two that we drop off and pick up. Everything else we buy and throw out. Cleaners, shoes, and film. Kleesham. And there's no dominant market leader. So I guess in your neighborhood, 100 people, where you go grocery shopping, 80% will get the same answer. When it comes to the cleaners, I don't know, guy down, oh, he screwed me. I go to the next guy. There's no yeah. loyalty there. I wanted to build out like a massive chain. We drop, you know, now Uber, you can think about it much easier. Imagine you just like, you pick it up at your house, drop it off at your office, keep it in your car, pick it up, you know, upstate, in a different house, like crazy stuff. You know, I wanted to do that. In, like, like the way like um, some of these car dealerships built themselves, like the enterprise, like a college kid, like walk into a place, like coffee, serve for free. Like that was the vision. Yeah. And my father told me, yeah, I don't like that idea so much. I have a friend of mine in real estate. Why don't you go talk to him? And I went there and that was, uh, you know, doing this, I'm fortunate to be doing the same thing my whole, my whole, uh, I started in 97. Doing the same thing my whole career. So it's 27 years, the same thing. Well, seems seems like you've been successful. So maybe your dad was right on this one. <laughs> you, yeah, you, f- film would have been uh, film would have been long since gone from that uh, cliche. So you uh, would have had that uh, that. No, maybe I tell people that if it would have, I would have developed the, uh, the digital camera. You know, right? Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. We could, could have taken everything a whole, whole different direction. But um, no, that's that's an amazing story. Uh, when people hear this and they want to reach out to you, what what's the best way? So. I give out my cell number okay. and my email. So my cell number is 917-597-2197. Um, probably best to WhatsApp or text. Um, email is probably a little bit better, a little bit. Also is IRZ, IRA, and then Z is a lot of it. So IRAZ at gparency.com, G-P-A-R-E-N-C-Y. Gparency is the acronym for GP, for General Honor and Transparency. Um, and, you know, just you come to the website. I find that, you know, to offer you know the service and my goal is I'd like to be able to help and give back. So if someone has any real estate questions, I can guide them, I'd like to help them. And um someone that's uh you know someone's looking for a mortgage, I'm sure I'll help you. If someone looking for a job is say if someone in the audience that's uh has someone in the family wants to break into real estate, good in sales, so that's your parents dot com forward slash hiring. So but um ho- hopefully I could uh keep merit to make a living and be able to give back at the same time and you know keep uh Keep keep revolutionizing the business and live up to Jeff Bezos' quotes, like I said before, and be able to do it. That uh, you know, it's irresponsible without, without running a deal by Jim uh, Yeah, that's, that's not. I think it's a great it's a great take on it. Um, well, listen, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time out today. Uh, it's been been a great conversation, and I think uh, truly, uh, I just enjoy hearing you know kind of about people with visionary ideas. I think I think there's a lot of things that stay the same because that's the way we've always done it. And I think that is the worst reason to do something uh, you could possibly think of. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Just, (laughs) just doing it because we, because that's how it's always been done is, is just um, sort of irresponsible, I think, in, in, in not going to uh, push, push things forward. So thank you so much for, for coming on and, and sharing your story. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, Jason. Absolutely. Folks listening, um, I know you're going to love this one. Please like, rate, and review the show so we can get more great guests like Ira. And thank you all for listening. Hey there, I am Dr. Jason Ballara, and this is the Know Your Why podcast, where we explore the why behind success. Every week, I meet with real estate investors, veterinary entrepreneurs, mindset coaches, authors, and fitness professionals to uncover their why and how it drives them on the winding road to success. What is your why?